Good morning, church. Good morning. Will you pray with me? Holy Spirit, thank you for being here. May we hear a word from you this morning. Will you use me as your mouthpiece? Will you teach us something new about who you are or who we are in light of your kingdom? Speak to us with words or straight to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, good morning. I'm Jill Brinkerhoff, and I'm the director of family ministries here at UPC. I moved to Seattle about five years ago to work here, and it's been a joy and a pleasure to work with all of you. Uh, My personal life has seen many ups and downs, Um, and as many of you know, both of my parents have passed away since I started working here and since I moved to Seattle. I moved from Southern California, and I have a younger brother. You can go ahead and show that family picture. That's my younger brother, Chad, my sister-in-law, Elizabeth, and Wyatt and Bentley, my nephews. I am so excited to see them on Wednesday. They'll be flying up here to spend Thanksgiving with me and some of our other family. And I get to fly down about four times a year and spend time with them. Um, They're my favorite. (laughs) Well, I live alone in Kenmore. And on a Thursday in August, I invited two coworkers, Anna and Amani, to come and work with me from my house for the day. So we set up our laptops and my dining room and we're doing work and had some lunch together and then we decided to take a break and take a little walk right outside of my house. I was wearing the same rainbow flip-flops I've worn a bajillion times, but somehow tripped, immediately knew something was wrong with my ankle, fell to the ground, slamming my hands and my knees to the concrete and just kind of writhed in pain and rolled over on my back and had to lay there for a second. And they're like, what just happened? I'm like, I don't know, but it hurts. Um, So they helped me kind of stand on my one good leg and supported me while I hopped back to my home and then up the stairs to the main level in my house that I I had to kind of crawl up the stairs. And then I knew something was wrong with my arm too. And I sat on the floor, and Imani got me ice for my ankle, and Anna ran all around my house looking in all of my cupboards for bandages because my knee was bloody. Uh, And by that point, my ankle was already the size of a golf ball and getting bigger, swollen on the outside, and I was like, I think we need to go to urgent care. And I had just moved to Kenmore. I had no idea where the urgent care was, so we looked it up. And they helped me get back down my stairs and into my car, and they drove me Um, just a quarter mile away to this evergreen urgent care. They got me in, got me settled, and then they went and waited nearby at a coffee shop because it took a couple hours for all the x-rays and everything. Um, From urgent care, I'm texting some different people to tell them about my fall, including Jennifer, and she was still at work here, and she knew that the church has these great scooters And right away, she loaded one into her car. She said, just in case. And I was like, well, I don't know if I need it yet, but but thanks for doing that. Well, I had fractured my right ankle and my left elbow, and it was too painful to put any weight, even with the walking boot, on my foot. So I was wheeled in a wheelchair out to the car, and Anna and Imani drove me back to my house. Um, and kind of got me settled there on the couch. But after they left, I was like, well, I need to use the restroom, and it's way over there from the couch. How do I do that? I tried to hop, and even just tapping my toe down was just excruciating. Um, I needed to text Jennifer and say, actually, I will take you up on that. I do need help. I need you to bring the scooter. So that night she brought the scooter. She, 
it's pretty heavy and carried it up my stairs for me so that I could have it on the main level where I have a powder room and my couch and kitchen and got me settled again. Um, now, my aunt and uncle live out in Sammamish, and they texted me and said, hey, do you need help? Do you need to come and stay with us? I was like, no, I think I'm okay. I'll try it tonight on my own. Well, I knew I'd sleep a lot better in my bed, which was another floor up, and my shower and bathroom and everything you know, all my stuff was up there. So I left the scooter on the main level and crawled with my one good arm and one good leg, kind of, I don't know, sometimes I would go forward without getting a bloody knee on the carpet, and then other times I'd go backwards. But I got up to that level, but then standing from there, again, was very hard and excruciating just to get into the bed. And then I was like, well, now I need to go to the bathroom, and how do I do that? So I ended up doing a lot of crying that night in pain and just feeling sorry for myself and lonely. And so the next morning I called my uncle, my mom's brother, Bill, and said, I'm going to need help. Um, I'm going to need to come stay with you. So he drove out and loaded the scooter in his truck and the shower stool in his truck and watered my plants for me, packed my bag for me, including my underwear, which was very humbling, and <laughs> packed it all in his car and helped me get down the stairs and took me to their house. And um, that was a picture of me on their couch, propping up my foot in their living room, where I was for a week and a half. Um, and they would carry the scooter up the stairs for me, at night so that I could get between the guest bedroom and the bathroom and down the stairs for me in the morning. And they'd put the shower stool in and out of their shower for me so I could use that. My aunt would constantly bring me fresh ice packs for my ankle. They made me really good food and even did my laundry for me. And I was blessed to be able to have them. Um, Others reached out too. Thank you, Debbie, for the rides and the meal. And um, the UPC prayer teams were praying for me. I just had someone come up last week. She's like, oh, you're Jill. Oh, I was praying for you and for healing. <laughs> and so people I don't even know um, covering me in prayer. So thank you for that. I'm going through physical therapy on my ankle now, but you can see it's getting much better. Um, it is sore today because of all the work the PT had me do, but... Praise God, it's getting better. But we live in a time and place that puts a very high value on independence. I put a high value on my independence and my self-sufficiency. Reaching out for help can feel weak or even embarrassing. Letting people in to see my dirty laundry literally and figuratively was hard and required a setting aside of some of my pride. I'm sure some of you can also relate to not wanting to be a burden on another person or get in the way of someone's plans. We talk a lot in church about loving and serving and caring for others, and that is incredibly important, and we will talk about that today too. But it's also important that we be able to open ourselves up to receive help and care and prayer from others, and that can feel really vulnerable. In our passage today, Jesus washes the feet of the disciples, and I can relate to Peter in this passage. The scene takes place on the night of the Last Supper, when Jesus and his disciples are gathered to share the Passover meal together. Before Jesus breaks the bread and says, this is my body broken for you, or pours the wine and says, this is my blood, shed for you, and the disciples don't know what he means yet. After that, Jesus will take some of them with him while he prays in the garden. It's the most stressed and burdened that we see Jesus because he knows he's about to be tortured and is going to die, and his friends keep falling asleep. It is in that garden where he's betrayed and arrested. I'll be reading 
from John chapter 13, and it's a long passage, so I'll go ahead and read it, but if you want to follow along, please look at the screens or in the Pew Bibles. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, you do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, one who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you, for he knew who was to betray him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe, and had returned to the table, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. This is the word of the Lord. In this passage, Jesus humbles himself to the job and posture of a servant. He lowers himself in status and stature. The disciples would have worn sandals and walked on dusty roads earlier in the day. Their feet would have been caked with grime and dirt. Jesus, wrapping himself in a towel, lowers himself physically and kneels down. He dives his hands into the water, and some of the dirt and grime would have gotten on him in the process of washing. This reminds me of the time that Jesus entered the graveyard with a demon-possessed man and healed him. Or when he touched those who would have been considered unclean with diseases or sin and heals them. Peter says, don't wash me. I can relate to Peter here and maybe some of you can too. um, In more ways than one. Well, when I was on a mission trip in high school, we joined together with another church. So there were two youth groups doing a mission trip together, and um, we wore sandals outside, tromping through dirt and forest. And that evening, the youth pastor surprised us by saying we were going to randomly be assigned to wash one another's feet. And I was assigned to wash and receive washing from a high school boy from the other church who I didn't know and who I thought was kind of cute. And it was very awkward and vulnerable uh, to receive that washing. He got in between all of my toes and he really went to down on it. Um, But if that was vulnerable, how much harder would it have been for Peter to allow his rabbi and teacher and Lord to wash his grimy feet? And how much harder is it for us to allow Jesus to get in there and really clean the dirt and grime out of our lives? Jesus says, unless I wash you, you have no share with me. We don't need to clean ourselves up before we approach Jesus. He wants us as we are. Jesus even washes Judas's feet, the one who would betray him later that night. No one is too dirty or unclean or sinful to be washed by Christ. 
He knows the dirty parts of us already anyway. He will clean us and forgive us. His blood and sacrifice will cleanse us. We need to allow Jesus to wash our souls, S-O-L-E-S, and ask him to cleanse our souls, S-O-U-L-S. Judas received the foot washing, but he wouldn't receive the soul washing. After Jesus washes the disciples' feet, has the Passover meal, and gets betrayed and arrested, this happened the next day from John 19, 1 through 3. It says, Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Jesus was mocked and tormented in the midst of being physically tortured. He never struck back or said a bad word against the mockers. He even asked God the Father to forgive them before he breathes his last breath. Jesus is different than every other king, emperor, prime minister, president, or person with authority that we can think of. Our king wasn't wealthy. He didn't live in a castle or have high status. He shared a table with sinners and betrayers and prostitutes and tax collectors. He died a criminal's death on a wooden cross wearing a crown of thorns beneath a sign that mocked his kingship. But our king is the one whose death healed humanity's relationship with our maker. Jesus' death and resurrection means we can be washed clean by his blood, the blood of the perfect, spotless, sinless lamb. We can receive grace upon grace upon grace and, and can freely approach the throne of God no matter how dirty and sinful we are. Because once we proclaim that Jesus is our king and savior, God sees sons and daughters when he looks at us. I'm reminded of a song here, and I am not a singer, so I'm going to need you to sing along with me, just a verse and a chorus. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Good job. Amen. D.A. Carson, in his commentary, The Gospel According to John, writes, As with the crucifixion, so with the foot washing, each is simultaneously an act of God by which human beings are freed or cleansed, whether in reality, the cross, or in symbol, the foot washing, and an example that Jesus' followers are to emulate. Jesus tells us to follow his example and wash one another's feet. My aunt and uncle and coworkers and friends did that for me after my fall. And here's another example. This last winter, I knew that I was going to need to have a surgical procedure done, and I got it scheduled with my doctor for early April. At one appointment, my OBGYN explained in more detail about the surgery, and it turned out that it was going to be more invasive and a bigger deal than I'd expected. She said I wouldn't be able to drive for a week and that I would need somebody to come and stay with me. When I got into my car right after that appointment, I burst into tears. I missed my mom so much and wished that I can call her and ask her to come and stay with me and take care of me. And I know that without a second thought, she would have done it. I missed my dad, too, knowing he would have been next on the list. In years past, he'd already spent some time on an air mattress in my living room when he helped me move here and when he came to visit. 
I didn't really want to ask anybody else. I wasn't sure who I'd feel comfortable being that vulnerable in front of. And um, I was kind of thinking through a cousin or a friend, knowing they had full-time jobs and other responsibilities. Well, I called my brother later that day because I knew he'd understand missing our parents. And I didn't even consider asking him to leave his family or take time off work and fly up here, but he offered immediately. When I tried to say no and that I'd find someone else, he said, Jill, this is what we do for each other. And that was that. I knew that I would do the same for him. Chad and I are bonded not only because of genetics, but because of the two hospital rooms we spent time in with our dying parents. We have a bond beyond our genes. So I received his help, and he was a good nurse. He drove me to and from the surgery. He listened to the surgeon. He was forced to look at photos of my insides. Uh, He set timers for my medications. He did grocery runs. He made food, and he was good company. Well, church, we are forever bonded because of the blood of Jesus. In John's gospel, after he is resurrected, Jesus refers to the disciples as brothers. Before that, he refers to them as friends, servants, disciples. But after sin and death are conquered and the curtain of the temple is torn in two, Jesus calls them family. Because of the cross and the resurrection, we can be called sons and daughters of the Most High God. We are brothers and sisters, and we are told to wash each other's feet, to forgive one another, and to carry each other's burdens. Church, this is what we do for each other. That means not only being the ones to help others, but being the ones to humble ourselves and ask for help and receive care as well. Well, this morning, I have three questions for us to consider this week and some takeaways. So would you take out your phone and open up the Notes app or write in the margins of your bulletin, or maybe you brought a journal and you could write these three things down. Question number one, how do you need to receive help or prayer from someone this week? Maybe you would really like somebody to go with you to a doctor's appointment that you have coming up, and you've been too shy or embarrassed to ask. You can write that down and reach out to somebody. Put yourself out there. Open yourself up vulnerably to somebody. Maybe you are new to Seattle, and you don't know very many people yet, and when you moved here... Maybe you're a young adult or a college student. You had some family that said, oh, I know someone who lives in Seattle, and maybe it's time that you reach out to that person and connect and get coffee with them. Maybe you need something that our deacons could provide, like a handy scooter or a walker or some prayer. Um, you can reach out to the deacons by emailing suebb at upc.org. Let them know what's going on. Let them know what you could use help with. Question two. To whom could you reach out to to offer help or an invitation? Maybe you can think of somebody who might be feeling lonely during the holidays and you can invite them to join your table. Maybe you can think of someone that you should call this week or send a card to or a text to check in on them. Maybe there's another way that you could reach out to someone in your life that you've been maybe putting off or meaning to do or haven't gotten around to yet. You could type that in. And question three, how do you need to submit to Jesus today? How have you been like Peter, pushing Jesus' cleansing away? Do you need to receive care, hope, companionship, or love from Jesus? Do you need to confess your lack of submission to his authority, his voice, 
his leading, or your pride in not accepting his help or grace. Let's pray. Thank you, King Jesus, for your model of humility and servanthood to each of us. Let us set aside our pride and reach out for help and to love and serve one another. Thank you, Lord, for your power and your conquering of sin and death. May we receive your cleansing, your forgiveness, and your grace. In your holy name we pray. Amen.